afternoon. I am going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first, just a little business. If you are unmuted, if you would please mute uh, so we don't get any background noise from anyone, I'd appreciate that. Um, so my name is Sandy Holterhouse. I'm a registered dietitian, licensed in the state of Iowa, and I'm also a certified yoga teacher and health coach. I do have my email here on the first page. So if you are interested in emailing me any questions um, or getting information from me, you're welcome to do that. That's sandra.holterhouse at collins.com. Um, my office is in the Collins Aerospace Rec Center. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Today we're talking about intuitive eating. And we'll start out with just kind of a definition of intuitive eating. So um, I like to think of uh, intuitive eating, it's a, a large process that integrates your mind, your body, and your spirit. Now, some people use intuitive eating and mindful eating interchangeably, but when I'm speaking of mindful eating, I'm speaking of just a piece of intuitive eating. So really that part where you're incorporating your brain and your thoughts with your body and your spirit um, around all the processes of eating. So I'm talking about when you're going to the farmer's market or you're going to the store to pick up food, when you're planning your menu, when you're uh, unloading your food at home, everything, um, the whole process can be integrated into this intuitive eating type of lifestyle. So you're being very uh, mindful about what you're buying, you're being um, just integrating your um, body. When we get into um, the slides a little further, we'll talk about how you listen to your hunger and your fullness cues. But you also have to listen to your spirit. And, you know, say, for example, someday you've had a salad for a week every day at lunch, and you just decide that instead you want to have, you know, a, a chicken sandwich and some sweet potato fries. That's kind of how you incorporate the spirit of um, eating into your body you all, in, with your mind and your body. So making those choices every day. And with intuitive eating, no foods are off limits. Um, that's kind of the beauty of it. But um, I don't want to give you the impression that intuitive eating is easy because, because it does really incorporate a lot of thinking and you know centering your um, mind, body, and spirit working together to um, get you to that place where you want to be with your eating. So you might hear um, intuitive eating also called mindful eating, like I said, weight neutral, a non-diet approach, health at every size, weight inclusive, or all foods fit approach. And those could all uh, refer to an intuitive eating uh, lifestyle. So First of all, just why diets aren't working for us. And there's a lot of studies out there um, that talk about uh, dieting and how they have failed us. And of course, all the billions of dollars that we spend on um, dieting and dieting products every year. Um, but 95% of people who actually lose weight on a diet will regain that weight within zero to five years. And I tell people when I'm talking with them, um, there is um, the Weight Information Network website. So it's called WIN, W-I-N. And to be able to like post information on that website, you've had to have weight loss, a, a significant amount of weight loss and kept the weight off for a period of time. And so what they're really finding is, you know, to get the weight off, you know, listening to your body, uh, eating a healthful diet or a lifestyle like, Mediterranean, something like that, will help you get to that weight where you wanna be. But then it's exercise. So exercise really kicks in big when you want to maintain that weight. And that's what um, that weight information network, if you do go out and look at that, you'll hear that from most all the participants on there that are talking about just how much it takes to uh, keep the weight off, maintain that weight with exercise. Um, the other things, we go into a diet thinking that it's a short term, we're going to lose that weight, it's going to stay off forever, we're never going to gain that weight back, and um, unfortunately we're disappointed when we start to gain that weight back. Um, we also know that restriction, um, you know, when anyone tells you you can't have something, we're all, we all have a little bit of a rebellious spirit, I think, and 
Um, what that can then lead to is you go on a diet and then when you decide that you're coming off of that diet or you just go off that diet, you start to overeat. And this can set you up for that cycle of uh, binging. So it uh, can be very um, disruptive to your eating pattern to start a diet. And then when you go off of it, and in fact, we know that people who diet are eight times more likely to actually develop an eating disorder. And I will touch on eating disorders a little bit at the end of this presentation. Um, and also one of the ways that our body responds to um, dieting is to hold on to those calories that we're taking in that energy. It slows our metabolism down. We also know that um, children who were abused, um, they are much more likely to be overweight or obese as adults. Um, so intuitive eating is really a shift in a diet mindset. And I like to think, um, just kind of the simplest way to say it is it's getting away from external cues and moving toward internal cues. So if you think about external cues, you are sitting in front of a plate of food or you go into a bakery and there's so many choices um, that just kind of overwhelms you and it's really easy to overeat in those circumstances. Or maybe you're with a friend you haven't seen for a while and they're having a certain food that you haven't had for a while. So you decide that you want to have that food as well. Um, but when you shift to more internal cues, you start to ask yourself and continually ask yourself, um, what is it that I want right now? What is it that my body needs right now? And how much do I need? And I'll show you a tool for that here in a slide or two. So with intuitive eating, um, it's about really bringing the joy and abundance back to eating. So satisfaction should be your focal point and feeling good should be a focal point. Um, but again, you're not going to feel satisfied if you don't eat enough food. You're also not going to feel satisfied if you eat too much food. So it's kind of like finding that sweet spot where you're... Um, feeling, you know, full and happy and like you had enough, but not overeating or not under eating or under nourishing yourself. Um, it's also about respecting your body, regardless of what your shape or size is, and then also selecting food without judgment. So we've actually given um, morality to food. We, we call foods bad or good. In actuality, they're just food. There's no goodness or badness uh, to food. Um, so taking away that judgment. And as we go through the 10 um, intuitive eating principles, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So why learn to eat intuitively? Um, well, one of the first things I think of is like the diet rules that are crushing us. And what I mean by that is you're probably told, oh, I can't eat after 7 p.m. And I can't eat until 11 a.m. And maybe I shouldn't eat gluten. Maybe um, I shouldn't have any carbs in my diet. So we have all these rules and every diet's a little bit different when you look at all these, um, these diets that are out there and we keep adding more and more rules to ourselves. And that's one of the things I see when I see clients is they're just really confused about what they should and shouldn't eat. And so that's one of the premises of learning to eat intuitively is that you can eat all foods. Um, so the other promise or other premises are eating the right amount of food. So that's again, that mind and body connection. So eating um, the right amount of food based on when you're hungry and when you're full, um, that can lead to that healthy weight or right sizing you. Um, when you eat intuitively, it also increases free choice, you know, so it reduces that rebellion. You're not eliminating like a whole macronutrient like carbohydrates from your diet. So um, you don't have to rebel and go on a binge um, when you uh, secretly decide that you want to have all those carbohydrates again. So again, the goal is that self-regulation, really listening internally to what your body needs and everybody's gonna be different in what they need and how much they need. Um, and that starts to regain and rebuild that trust and that confidence with yourself and with eating. Because a lot of us have lost that um, 
ability to trust ourselves around certain foods. You might tell yourself, I can't bring that in the house because I'll eat too much. Where with intuitive eating, what you're trying to do is, oh, I can bring in that, that into the house because I'm going to trust myself to only have um, a portion of it. So it's uh, built to repair your relationship with food over time. So this is the tool that I use with people when they're starting uh, to learn to eat intuitively. And you can find um, hunger scales all over the internet. Um, what you'd want to look for if you're going to print one off is one that has the information underneath, um, like of what the uh, your level of hunger or fullness is. So um, when we look at this hunger scale, uh, five would be uh, feeling like you're satisfied. So kind of the neutral place. So I just like you to close your eyes for a moment. And if you were to assess your hunger right now, would you say, am I ready to eat? Am I starting to feel really hungry? Am I really starving? You know, or did I just eat? Am I feeling full and satisfied? Am I feeling over full? Did I eat too much and I don't feel well? And then just kind of look at the scale here and kind of see where you're at. Because this is the tool that you would continually use when you are deciding when to start eating and when to stop eating. And when you get good at using this tool, you can really start to see the nuances uh, between the different numbers here. So say you're at a five um, and it's, you know, 11 in the morning, maybe you exercise that morning and you know on those mornings that you exercise, you're going to be extra hungry. And maybe by 11 o'clock, you know, wow, within a half an hour, I'm going to be to a three, you know, so you start to really recognize those things about yourself. And then um, what you want to do, the goal here is that you want to try to stay between a three and a seven all day long. So that might mean that you're eating every, you know, two and a half to four hours. So you're trying to continually nourish your body so you don't get um, starving or too hungry or hangry, or you don't get, um, or you don't, and you don't jump to the other side. So usually what happens when we get here and we haven't planned ahead as we jump over to a nine or a 10 and we eat whatever's in sight, whatever's available. And um, so part of also, I think using the hunger scale is also planning once you figure out how quickly you become hungry again, um, what uh, circumstances make you hungry, um, then that is when you can start to really plan and have um, snacks that you enjoy, um, planning meals that you enjoy so that you're ready when um, you start to get hungry. Um, so I do want to say there are um, some reasons that we may not feel our hunger and our fullness cues that well. Certain medications can increase or decrease our appetite. So please be aware of those. If you're taking any of those, um, you might have to pay more attention to your portion size on your plate. Um, if you have over eight and under eight all of your life, um, your hormones can get off slightly. So that may also affect um, how you determine or if you can determine if you're hungry or full. So um, just in those cases, you might possibly have to start with a plate, serving a, a small amount of food on the plate and then starting to regain your confidence. And I believe that after, if you start to follow this process and really listen to your body and to give your body what it's asking for, that it will begin to trust you again and um, hopefully start to give you those right, those correct signals again as well for hunger and fullness. So this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you start to reclaim your intuitive eater, um, how we practice mindfulness at the plate, how we can reframe cognitive distortions, which are really associated with the seventh principle of intuitive eating, that emotional and stress eating. We'll talk a little bit about that and then uh, calming your emotional eater as well. So practicing mindfulness at the plate. Um, there's a mindful eating plate that's out there and it you can find it online if you're wanting to get a printout of this, but really kind of goes to how you want to sit down to your plate 
Um, if you can take the stressors away, you know, um, and sit down at a plate, at your plate in an enjoyable, more relaxing atmosphere, um, that's ideal. Um, when I was learning to mindful eat the, uh, more, I would actually, I started by eating by myself so that I could really tune into the nuances of mindful eating and it gets easier as you practice. Um, but what we want to do when you're thinking about mindful eating is, you know, observing. So maybe you look at that hunger scale, maybe you keep that hunger scale um, where you eat and uh, no judgment here. If you eat at your chair in your living room, or if you eat at the table or at your desk at work, um, keeping a hunger scale there. So you can start out each eating um, opportunity by really deciding how hungry am I? And then, um, you know, when you start to slip into a three or a four, that's when you want to start nourishing yourself again. So use that hunger scale, observe that, ask your body how hungry you are, listen to your body. And um, that sometimes I like to tell people it's um, more difficult to notice fullness than it is to, to notice um, hunger. So, and I think the reason is because we tend to eat so quickly, we don't actually, you know, slow down to really ask ourselves if we're still hungry. And especially if there's still more food on our plate, and we just go ahead and mindlessly eat the rest of the food, um, no matter whether we're hungry or not. So really listening to your body. Um, awareness. So when you're tuning in, being aware, being mindful, you really want to um, learn to taste every bite. So if you've heard about slowing down um, and chewing your food, you know, 20 to 30 times, um, you know, and just really enjoying the food, tasting it. So that comes into that um, awareness and that savoring. So savoring each bite of food. So you don't eat your whole plate of food and go, wow, did I just eat my whole plate of food? You're actually um, have tasted your food. You've actually enjoyed it. And just so savoring and being aware um, of what you've eaten. You want to be in the moment. So you want to try not to be uh, doing paired activities if possible. You want to try to not be on the computer or not watching television um, so you can be fully present. Um, also, it's helpful to uh, express gratitude for your food. So maybe you're thinking about where your food came from and just slowing yourself down a little bit to really enjoy your food. And then also eating without judgment, you know, so not saying, oh, I have chocolate cake on my plate. I shouldn't eat that. Oh, but I really want it. So then you're already having a battle with yourself, just enjoying the food that you have and being compassionate with yourself. Um, it's okay to have like all foods in included in your diet and, um, you know, just giving your body what it needs and maybe your spirit um, needs some chocolate that day. So you want to feed your spirit as well as your body and your mind. So overcoming cognitive distortions. So um, cognitive distortions are negative um, items that we tell ourselves, our thoughts that are not really true, but they keep us stuck. And we all um, use cognitive distortions. It becomes a coping mechanism at times. Um, but just some examples kind of related to food is, you know, all or nothing thinking. Um, say you overate on um, M&Ms one night. And then the next, after you did that, you felt guilty. So you said, I can never have M&Ms in my house again. So the hopeful, hopeful, hopefulness here is that you really don't have to be black or white here. You can be gray. You can't have those M&Ms in your house. Maybe you find another way um, to bring them in in smaller packages or whatever you need to do um, to make sure that you're not going to eat, you know, like a whole big bag of M&Ms or that type of thing. So you can have those foods in your house. Um, Overgeneralizing, you know, I always gain the weight back, weight back. So why should I even um, attempt a new diet or to change my eating habits? So um, again, when you think about that, those those type of things that we tell ourselves, 
um, they can impact us in a very uh, negative way. Uh, diminishing positives, you might say, I only lost two pounds. It wasn't worth it. Why did I, you know, struggle so much this week and only lose two pounds? Where, you know, if you reframe that in a different way, it could be, wow, I lost two pounds this week and and I'm on my way, you know. So um, again, it's the things that we're telling ourselves. You maybe make everything a catastrophe. Maybe you're weighing yourself constantly every day and you um, gained a pound this day and then you start thinking, what did I eat? Blaming it on something that you had the day before or that morning. Um, and then it you know, becomes a catastrophe and I can't eat that food again. So um, just again, thinking about how these cognitive distortions can affect you um, when we get into these thoughts um, of, with cognitive distortions, a lot of times we think we can't change them, but they really are just thoughts. So we can start to turn them around if you can catch them. And again, I think of this as part of um, the principle number seven, the emotional um, and stress eating. Um, jumping to conclusions, you say someone's preparing sweet potatoes. You say, I don't like sweet potatoes, but um, maybe they're prepared a different way and maybe you might like them that way. So um, you can always, you know, try things in a different way and it might be uh, that you find it more acceptable or pleasing and prepared in a different way or labeling. Um, you might tell yourself, I'm lazy, I'm not good enough. Um, and what happens when you start in these cognitive distortions is kind of becomes a circle or spiral and it can be um, I'm not good enough. That person can lose weight and I can't lose weight. Um, uh, I don't like it when I can't fit in my clothes. And it goes on and on and on into what I call a vicious circle. And um, that's when you're starting to go into those vicious circles. That's when you really need to start catching those thoughts and turning them around, turning them around to be more positive. So emotional eating. Emotional eating would be what we describe as eating to um, suppress, suppress or soothe or numb negative emotions. Um, but I also want to say that you can overeat when you're feeling positive too, right? So we all know that. Um, but in general, we relate it to um, these feelings of stress or anger, fear. Boredom is a big one. A lot of times uh, clients tell me they get home from work and they're bored and they find it's just really easy to soothe themselves with food, um, maybe sadness, maybe you've lost a relationship or a loved one, uh, loneliness. Again, all these feelings can um, lead to um, overeating, emotional eating, stress eating. So to some of those triggers, um, relationship conflicts, maybe it can be you know with a, a child or a spouse or um, family member or a friend, uh, career work or stress, um, you know, just being fatigued. And most of us are, um, you know, we're going, going, going all day long. And, um, you know, you get home in the evening. And um, I notice this with myself sometimes that I just feel really tired. And the first thing I think of is I need some energy. I need to feed myself um, when maybe I just need um, a soothing uh, bath or a book or something like that, just to take my mind off and help me to wind down to get some sleep. Financial pressures, health problems, those can all be things that trigger um, emotional or stress eating. Um, there are some techniques. Um, I know when I talk to people about writing in a journal, it appeals to part of the um, the population and another part of the population says that would never be for me to sit down and write, but it is a uh, technique that um, is used quite frequently for people when they're trying to determine, you know, when they, maybe when they get home from work and they're, all they want to do is start eating, um, actually starting to write down and, and get in touch with some of these negative feelings. And the, the first step to you know, healing is uh, being aware of what those those feelings are. Uh, stress reduction, you know, if you like meditation or yoga or exercise or um, reading a book, whatever it is that might help reduce stress for you and always, um, you know, developing new hobbies or activities that helps us 
keep our minds young, our brains young, and um, usually gets us excited again about doing something different. So those can all be things that you can do to help with the emotional or stress eating. So just going through the 10 principles of intuitive eating, and I'll show the book here at the end. Um, it's, it's in the slides. These 10 principles, I just want to tell you, there's a chapter on every principle um, in the book. So if you are really interested in intuitive eating, I would encourage you to pick up the book. Um, it was first written in 1995, and it more focused, uh, the dietitians that wrote it, more focused on um, people with eating disorders. But as uh, time has gone on, we've all found that, um, you know, there we have a, a lot of people that have gained weight, you know, become overweight or obese, and um, a lot of people that binge eat. So um, a lot of people do have um, a reason to start to embrace more intuitive eating again. So the first step is rejecting that diet mentality. So um, if you think about it with the diet, you've got the scale at home, you're stepping on your scale frequently, hopefully not every day, or I have had a client that stepped on three times a day. Um, it can become very obsessive and you're only actually looking at one number. Oops, I hit my, sorry about that. Um, so with rejecting that diet mentality, we also are, focusing on, um, you know, we are driven to eat to survive. So um, restricting um, is not really what we are meant to do. And um, we found in, in studies of people or populations that went through famine or um, were severely restricted in what they could eat, that when they came out of that phase, um, they tended to gain weight and gain weight fairly rapidly because they were able to eat again. So we are bi biologically driven to eat for survival. Um, we're driven to rebel. I talked a little bit about that when we are restricted. Um, and then you want to believe that your inner wisdom can guide you to what is the best diet for you. And I can tell you for myself, just my diet has evolved so much over time. You know, I've always found um, new foods that work for me. I can't eat like I ate when I was 20 or 25, but I've always found foods that I can enjoy and adapted to them. And, and different foods become popular too, um, as we learn more as the science gets better of what, what's healthy for you as well. So you also wanna reject new diets. You don't wanna try every fad diet that comes along and also, um, realizing that quick weight loss tricks aren't going to work for you. Honor your hunger. So this again is using that hunger scale. You want to eat when you're hungry, nourish your body when you're hungry, live in abundance, not restriction. And then you also want to find and eat slowly and find that point when you're starting to feel full. And that's when you want to say, oh, maybe I only need one or two more bites and then I'll put my plate in the fridge and I'll pull it back out later when I'm hungry again. So that's one of the beautiful things about intuitive eating is you can always save food for later knowing it's there and that you can eat when you are hungry again. Um, and I, this is just a, a quote from me here at the bottom. I, I feel that one of the most profound ways to respect your body is to eat the right amount of food to nourish it. After all, it knows what it needs. So just listening to it is so important. Oops. Um, the third principle is making peace with food. So start, stop labeling food, stop placing that morality on food, like labeling certain foods as good or certain foods as bad, um, but being all inclusive with what foods you can eat and stopping that love-hate relationship with food. So We've all gone through that as well. Like we are, we love to eat the food, but then when uh, we start the our clothes stop uh, fitting, then we we have this kind of hate relationship with food as well. So we just want to get out of that cycle, and then move away from pseudo dieting because you know once you've dieted once, you know how to do it, and it's pretty much kind of ingrained in you. Um, they call that pseudo dieting. But as long as you depend on you know a quick fix or something that you've learned to do to lose weight, you never truly can uh, develop that 
trust with yourself again, with your body again. Challenge the food police. Um, you know, start, start removing all those rules and all those things that are weighing us down that we've learned from all these diets. And, um, you know, stop telling yourself that, oh, I ate this today, so I'm bad. Um, or I ate this today, so I'm good. You know, so start really listening to those voices. Respect your fullness. So again, using that hunger scale, just really paying attention and trying to learn when you are full. And again, I said this is really difficult for a lot of people because maybe you only have 15 or 20 minutes to eat a meal um, and you're eating fast. So you just eat everything as quickly as possible. And you don't even ask yourself if you needed all that food, if your body needed all that food. So if you can pause um, and assess your fullness, that's a really important uh, tool. And then one of the things too, you might find, say you've been really craving, um, you know, a chocolate bar and you take that first bite and it's wonderful. You take that second and third bite and they're still really good, but maybe you get to that fifth or sixth bite and you're going, you know, there's some diminishing returns. It's just not tasting quite as good anymore. And maybe at that point you say, okay, I'm going to set this aside. Um, because there's nothing like hunger and um, not having the food available to you all the time that will drive you to that food more, you know, that, that it's tasting really good. But a lot of times you'll notice that, that the first few bites of a food are the best bites of that food. Um, we want to create meals and snacks that have staying power. So I generally say you want to have uh, carbohydrate, protein, and fats in all of your snacks and meals because the uh, fiber from the carbohydrate, um, the protein will keep you full. And then if you can incorporate some healthy fats as well, olive oil, that type of thing, that will also help keep you full longer. Um, so it has staying power. And then also, again, looking for that satisfaction. Maybe you eat your entire meal and it was good, but you're still looking for something um, that thing is probably the satisfaction. So what was it that was missing? And maybe you need a little snack or maybe there's something else that you need. Um, discover that satisfaction factor. So we really want to embrace, again, that joy and that pleasure of eating um, because it should be a joyful experience. And then satisfaction, if you eat something that satisfies you, it calms that sense of deprivation. And again, as I said, foods are more satisfying um, when you are moderately hungry. So once you start to get more full, then the foods don't taste quite as good. And again, always asking yourself to get, to get that satisfaction. Uh, what is it that you really want or what you really need um, in that moment? Seven is honor your feelings without using food. So this is the one that um, is all wrapped around that emotional and stress eating. Um, we know that overeating um, can lead to guilt or shame. How many people have gone to bed feeling um, guilt or shame because they ate too much um, that, that day, you know, and that we want to get away from that. So that's what intuitive eating can help you. And then learning to replace guilt with self-compassion. So giving yourself a little grace and just trying to also look at what are those underlying issues? Um, why did I overeat? Was it, um, you know, that I was looking for something to a sensory experience like caffeine or waking me up or something like that? Were you eating for comfort um, to distract yourself from other issues or problems to sedate yourself or help yourself, you know, to rest or sleep? Or maybe you were trying to punish yourself a little bit. Maybe, maybe actually you didn't eat that day and you're not feeling good because of that. Um, you ate too much the day before and you decided I'm not going to eat anything today. And you're, so you're punishing yourself. So just looking at some of those um, reasons that you might emotional or stress eat. Uh, number eight is respecting your body. So self-care um, you know, really taking care of yourself and um, doing what you need for your body. 
and dressing in comfortable clothes, no matter what your size. And I was at a wedding this weekend. And of course, there's all people of all shapes and sizes in there. But what I thought about everything was everyone looked so beautiful because they were all in their, their fine clothes. And it's, so it doesn't matter your uh, shape or your size. It's more about you being comfortable and just letting your inner beauty kind of flow. Um, respecting body diversity, you know, so respecting other people, uh, no matter again, what their shape or size, you know, color of their skin, um, diversity is what makes the world go around. I think makes the world a more exciting place. Principle nine is exercising and feeling the difference. Um, so exercise doesn't have to be this really horrible go out and run three miles or, or go sweat or something that you don't feel is right for you. What you want to do is try to find exercise and movement that you enjoy that feels good for you. So that may be walking. It may be um, doing Pilates or, you know, something that you enjoy. So just finding that thing for you is what's really important because that's what you're going to continue to do. And if you can find multiple things that you enjoy doing, I mean, I think that's even better just to have that active lifestyle and um, it can help you um, stay focused on other things that you enjoy and hopefully also and the, as a side benefit, uh, keep you from thinking about, you know, maybe your hunger or that type of thing as well. Um, I'm just noting orthorexia here. It's a... Uh, eating disorder, but it's described with an obsession with eating foods, only foods that one considers healthy. And that would be dependent on the person that has the orthorexia. Um, but they do this in order to feel superior to those who eat the foods that they avoid. And you see that a lot with, um, you know, mental illness, that, um, that obsession can be around them really wanting to feel superior because of what they do versus what someone else does. Um, we also see excessive exercise. And occasionally we have seen this in the gym, not, not frequently, but just someone who prioritizes their exercise foremost in their life. Um, they even exercise when they're sick or injured. Um, they avoid social functions to exercise um, or they have a obsessive and regimented exercise regime. So um, we want to, if you notice those tendencies in yourself, you may, uh, you know, you may want to seek some guidance or counseling because um, these things, this won't be healthy for you in, in the long term. So again, you want to get to that place where you are performing exercise, but that it's things that you enjoy doing. And then the 10th principle is honoring your health. So just kind of overall, all encompassing uh, choosing foods and exercise that actually make you feel good. Um, I do have in here some eating disorder stats, and this is from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, just um, for for interest, be, because again, the book um, Intuitive Eating it was first written, and um, the the whole process was used on people who had eating disorders back in the uh, late 80s and 90s. Um, and they wrote this book in the mid 90s. Um, but at least 30 million people of all ages and genders suffer from an eating disorder in the US. So I think we have, I don't know, last I kind of heard, we had about 350, 360 million people in the US. So, you know, close to 10%. And every 62 minutes, at least one person dies as a direct result from an eating disorder. Um, I was always told that anorexia nervosa was the most um, deadly because it is really hard to get uh, those people, um, those patients, oops, to um, eat um, even, you know, even after they've been hospitalized to get them back on the right track when they go home. Um, eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. And this was interesting to me that 13% of women over 50 engage in eating disordered behaviors. And you used to think that if you had an eating disorder, it would be discovered like in your teenage years or early 20s. Um, but 
it can also develop or be with you later in life as well. And there are more males um, also that have eating disorders, um, particular um, athletes that need to make weight, such as um, in wrestling, um, gymnastics, those type of things. Um, you would see a higher incidence of eating disorders. 16% uh, of transgender college students report having an eating disorder. And of course, there's a lot of complications in their lives. Um, maybe parents have um, you know, disowned them or not um, paying attention to them. So that is on the rise as well. Uh, military personnel, um, again, they're used to following orders, being very strict and regimented. Um, they have an increased risk of um, developing an eating disorder. Eating disorders affect all races and ethnic groups and genetics, environmental factors, personality traits, all combine to create risk for an eating disorder. Um, these are some warning signs of an eating disorder. Uh, preoccupation with weight, food, calories, Carbohydrates, you know, fat grams, dieting, um, that can be a first sign that someone is developing an eating disorder. Refusal to eat certain foods, and then it might progress to eating or cutting out a whole um, category of food. So maybe they decide they're not going to eat any carbohydrates. Um, they appear uncomfortable eating around others, um, skipping meals or taking smaller portions of food at your regular meals, withdraw from usual friends and activities, extreme concern with body size and shape, uh, frequent checking in the mirror for perceived flaws in appearance, and then extreme mood swings. And um, when checking in the mirror, um, generally with someone with an eating disorder, they do not really see themselves um, as other people would perceive or see them. They see themselves as, as possibly being overly heavy. Um, they pick apart every part of their body and compare it to other people constantly. So um, if you do notice any of these uh, signs in someone, then you should talk with them, maybe help them seek help. Um, that's all I have for the presentation. I was just going to cover kind of the services that I, I do right now at the rec center. Um, and then if I'll open it up, if you guys have any questions after that. So um, I do individual nutrition counseling. My 45 minute sessions are $16 for members or $32 for non-members. Um, that would be Collins employees or their family members who are eligible for that. I'm also doing power plate personal training. Um, that's something I just started this year um, because I was reading about how good it is for increasing bone density, balance, uh, circulation, helping to lower blood pressure, increasing core strength, um, can be great for muscle recovery and relaxation after hard workouts, and also helps with flexibility. So there's a lot of great benefits to doing a uh, power plate, but I do that um, through personal, personal training sessions. If you wanted to do one session with me, a 30 minute session would be $27. But as you, if you buy packages, the price goes down. So if you bought like a 15 package, the price would come down to 21 per uh, session. But I do do those. I get those in my schedule during the week. Um, I also want to just remind people I teach yoga on Thursdays from 920 to 1020 AM. And I'd encourage or invite you to come. Um, yoga is really good as a practice for people who are trying to become more mindful and aware and you know, learn about their bodies. Um, in fact, uh, yoga therapy is uh, used a lot of times with um, people with eating disorders. So um, if you're trying to learn to be more intuitive, more aware, uh, can be really good for you. Um, if you are not a member, but a um, our Collins uh, employee or a family member, um, the fee to come in uh, to the facility is $6 and you can uh, just stop at the front desk and sign up and that gives you the whole day. So you could uh, do other uh, things or schedule other services while you're in there as well. So that's just a little bit about what I do at the rec center. Um, this is the book. Um, 
intuitive eating. I read this probably back in 2011 or 2012. And the first time I read the book, I thought, oh, I'll never get people to eat this way. And um, later on, probably 2016 or 2017, I developed a class and Heidi went out and I taught that class at the rec center um, for about uh, probably two and a half, three years. Um, and we haven't taught it since prior to COVID. Um, but I do do individual counseling as well. If you want to learn to intuitive eat, um, you know, um, on an individual basis with me, I can practice, help you learn to practice the principles. So um, if, uh, if, Anyone has any questions? I'd open it up to questions right now. 